and I'm excited about this. I mean, he's he's a friend. I mean, um, well, and, uh, that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that many friends, so that's a big deal. <laughs> yeah, um, he's he's one of the people I met even before I came to. Um, I came to teach at Rollins. I came for a conference here, and he invited me to um, to a class that he was just taking, and um, asked me to share a few things. And we just, you know, um, became friends after that. Talked a lot. I like, sent emails and stuff. And so when I came here, I was like, um, "This is somebody I want to continue my relationship with." And and by the way, several years ago, when I went to teach in Ghana from from Purdue, I used his book. I didn't know him, I didn't know anything about him, but I thought his book was one of the best in the market, and that's what I use, and that's what you guys are using now. And you may have seen his face um, uh, on the My Own Lab stuff, but here he is in person. So please make, take full advantage of this time and, um, and use, use it properly. Okay. Thank you, man. Thank you very much for having me. Well, it's always good that you applaud at the beginning, because at the end you might not want to applaud, so that's, that makes me feel better. Um, thanks for coming today, thanks for inviting me. I thought I would uh, just uh, try something a little bit different, and I'll ask this question. Here's the title of my talk today. Would you red Ford trucks, Congo mines, and Lee Scott, Lee Scott was CEO of Walmart for many years, he just retired a few years ago. His canoe trip, what do they have in common? Probably nothing, right? Well, except they do, because it turns out that these are related to three of the most exciting things going on in operations management today. We're talking about global supply chains, we're talking about outsourcing, we're talking about sustainability, really hot topics that you read about every day in the newspaper. And uh, I thought I would tell you a couple stories about things that have gone on recently and are going on today, and then tie this all together with uh, why this course is the most important course you're going to take as an undergraduate. You probably don't believe that, but I mean, comparing it to accounting, which is really boring, right? And finance and some of these other things. Operations management is everything. I mean, most of the jobs in the world are in operations. It's running a hospital, it's running an airline, it's running the Orlando Magic Amway Center, or managing a team even. Um, building ambulances, building cars, building anything. It's all about operations management. The only people in the world who aren't in operations are people who are doing finance or accounting or people are doing sales and marketing. So most of us are going to be involved in careers and operations. And these are some pretty exciting things going on right now. So I thought I'd start by telling you a story about General Motors and the former vice president for purchasing there. His name was Jose Lopez. Uh, and Lopez was called the Grand Inquisitor. The New York Times wrote an article about him saying there had never been a person in charge of supply chains or purchasing who was more evil in the whole world. And he was like that because GM was hemorrhaging and losing billions of dollars a year. They brought this guy in, and they said, your job is to cut the cost of our parts and make us profitable again. And he said, OK, I can do that. And what he did right away is he went to all the part suppliers, thousands of them that provide windshields and, and windshield wipers and tires and batteries and motors and everything else for GM. And he said, effective today, you're cutting your price to us by 10%. They yelled and screamed, and he said, if you don't like it, you know, we'll find another supplier. And he said, oh, by the way, next year, you're going to cut it by another 10%, and the third year, you're going to cut it by 15%, if you want to continue to do business with the largest automobile manufacturer in the world. And he did. His first year, he saved them $3.4 billion in purchasing costs. So he was a hero at GM, and he had a loyal followers, I mean, uh, people who when he would eat certain things, they would eat certain things. He, he moved his wristwatch from his left hand to his right hand in a meeting one day and said, I'm not going to move it back until GM is profitable again. And everybody who worked for them moved their wristwatches to the right hand. They just, whatever he wanted to do, they did. But it happened that about two decades ago, when he was at his peak at GM, he, in the middle of the night, took his 20 top executives and 7 million pages of secret plans that GM had developed for what they called Plant X, that he had developed with his team, or Plant X. And he hopped on a plane to Germany, and he joined Volkswagen as, mineral, as vice president of purchasing and supply chain management, and brought all these 7 million pages with him. Now, GM, of course, was furious. And let me just explain a little bit about some of what he stole uh, an intellectual property right from GM. This Plant X was a new concept 
that Volkswagen then used and built their first plant in, uh, in Brazil using it. The concept is that you're building cars in this plant, but all the employees are people who work for your subcontractors. The only people you're going to have that actually work for you in the plant at Volkswagen, I think they had a half a dozen, were quality control people. So the people who put the tires on work for the tire manufacturer. And they manufacture the tires at plants adjacent to the manufacturing plant. And the people who put the windshields in were the people who made the windshields at a plant adjacent to the manufacturing facility for the Volkswagens. Every part, the batteries, whatever it was, were installed by the people who were making those parts adjacent to the plant. And that was a very efficient system. It was very novel, too. So imagine this huge factory and a handful of Volkswagen employees were in there. All right, so the bottom line, GM was furious, of course, and they sued Volkswagen in the world court, and they won the case. And they could, of course they were going to win, because it was industrial espionage, clearly. And they could have put Volkswagen out of business at that time, because they had done such severe damage. But what they discovered was very interesting about global supply chains. They discovered that Volkswagen was buying a lot of parts from them, for their cars, that GM was buying a lot of parts from Volkswagen for their cars, and they shared the same supplier base. And by driving Volkswagen under, they would destroy and harm themselves. So in the end, they settled for a $100 million check from Volkswagen as an apology, and a guarantee that Volkswagen would buy a billion dollars a year in GM parts. They discovered what we're all discovering now, that global supply chains are truly interrelated. In other words, you're not off on your own when you're building a car. There's a whole global network of people who are doing things for you. So that was the end of that. He never went to jail. He escaped to Spain, where he came from, in the Basque country. There was no extradition treaty. And he's lived out his life in, uh, in Spain. So that brings me to a second story about global supply chains. And here's something we discovered when the tsunami hit uh, in Japan three years ago. Remember the earthquake and tsunami destroyed a whole bunch of Japan, did terrible damage, and of course did a lot of damage to uh, manufacturers there. And there's a company called Itachi that makes a little product called an air sensor that goes inside every car. A little thing this big. But they were supplying about 60% of the air sensors to the whole world market. And their plant was destroyed. And companies like GM in the US, Volvo, Peugeot in France, uh, a whole bunch of others had to shut their plants because this was their only supplier for air sensors. And they hadn't even realized who their supply chain was. It was such a small part out of thousands of parts in a car that no one was watching that Hitachi had made these air sensors all these years and was making most of them and no one had a backup plan for what would happen if Hitachi went out or went under. So it was a big uh, revelation and everyone at that point uh, started realizing we have to have backup plans for our supply chains. We have to have redundant supply chains, and we can't just have Hitachi having a second plant in Japan because the whole country was vulnerable. We need to spread out our supply chains. Um, are you covering Supplement 11 in the book, Manuel? Um, not really. We're not just really. touching it a little bit. Okay, so in the Supplement and Supply Chain chapter, we talk about uh, some techniques uh, and how to determine how many backup suppliers you should have in case of an emergency. There are some analytical ways of doing this. But clearly things are changing, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, they found that out with Hitachi. And what did Ford discover? Ford, there's, there's a series of different tiers of suppliers. So your first tier suppliers are main suppliers who give you a primary product. So uh, Ford has a primary supplier of Sherwin-Williams for paint. Okay, everyone's heard of Sherwin-Williams. They make paint for all, <coughs> for all their cars and trucks. But it turns out in the paint, in certain colors, like black and red, is a chemical called Zerolac. And Zerolac is made <coughs> by one company in Japan, which was also wiped out during the tsunami. So people were walking into the Ford dealers looking for an Explorer, <coughs> or an Expedition, or a Lincoln, or any of the different Ford products, mostly the Ford pickup trucks. And they walked in, they said, where's my truck? I ordered a red truck, I ordered a black truck, sorry. There are no red or black trucks because the second tier supplier, not the main supplier that made paint, but the one who put the pigment into the paint was gone. So all of a sudden, their supply chain, and you couldn't get those color trucks. So it again showed how things filtered down uh, through the supply chains and down, uh, and down the line. <clears throat> so uh, the third story I want to tell you is about Congo. Uh, so there's another component 
that you may not be aware of. It's called a rare earth. And there are 17 different chemicals called rare earth. They're mined from the ground in minute quantities. So the Chinese control about 97% of the market. They dig up their dirt. They destroy the ground in doing so. We used to do it in this country. And then we decided we didn't want to do this, uh, this mining that tore up the earth anymore. But these rare earths are in every laptop. They're in every car sensor. They're in every wristwatch. They're in every laptop. They're in every uh, electrical component. They're in every laser light bulb. They're in every x-ray machine. Little, these minute components that you need of these 17 rare earths with very strange names like tantalum and lenophanium and a whole bunch of odd names. If you type in rare earths in your computer, you'll find out there's 17 rare earths. So China controlled the market. And five years ago, China said, forget it. Why should we keep exporting this stuff and helping everyone else? We're going to raise the prices by 500% and we're going to cut the exports. All the manufacturers around the world are saying, what should we do? We need these minute quantities of this thing that we've never heard of in every product we make. So they went to Australia, and Australia said, OK, we'll, we'll mine. We'll start mining. It'll take us years. We'll make some mines. We'll destroy our ecology. But it's going to be profitable. The United States didn't want to get back into it. And then they discovered that Africa was the main source outside of China of rare earths. And in these African mines, in the Congo in particular, they could find these rare earths that were needed for all of these high-tech products. Now, the problem was that the Congo, if you know much about it, there's all kinds of revolutions going on in the Congo. And at one point, the bad guys will control the mines. That's the rebels. And at one point, the good guys will control the mines. That's the government. And we really don't know on any given day who's doing the mining, because it just comes out. So uh, the US Senate, trying to do the right thing, declared that we will not be allowing any American company to buy rare earths that come from a rebel-held mine in the country. OK? You can do it from the government-held mine. And you have to submit a report to Congress every year saying where your rare earths came from. OK, so AT&T, which has 300,000 suppliers around the world of different components and parts and subcomponents, and third and fourth and fifth tier suppliers, goes in, and they come back in their first year to Congress, and they say, we don't know who controls the mines, and we don't have any idea where we're buying from, because we're not buying from a first tier supplier. We're not even buying from a second tier supplier. We're buying from someone who's a commodity broker who's buying from another commodity broker who's buying from somebody who's selling some of these rare earths outside the mine. And we don't have any idea which mine or which day of the week the rebels own the mine or which day of the week. So after this has been now three years of reports, Congress has said we give up. Nobody knows how to even monitor <laughs> where our rare earths are coming from, so forget it. You know, we're not going to find you and, and stop reporting because everyone's saying we can't report. We don't know what we're doing anyway. So it's kind of interesting how uh, these all deal with global supply chains in a way and how important they are and yet how little control in many cases the companies have over their own supply chains. All right, so let me turn from this to another uh, from, from uh, supply chains, supply chain management, to another topic that we're all familiar with that we talk about all the time in this country and around the world, and that's outsourcing. And this goes back decades now. We started outsourcing all of our manufacturing to China, right? So uh, it's become very severe. As you probably know, almost everything is made in China or someplace outside the US, and we've lost a lot of our manufacturing jobs, which is our middle class jobs, and it's a big problem in the US. As a matter of fact, there was a new Air Force base being built in um, Alaska, and the government mandated that 95% of all components or products going into building this base must be made in America. Well, that sounds like a nice plan, right? Pretty straightforward. And then they went, they found out, well, wait a minute, we don't make any doorknobs in America anymore. Okay, so we can't get the doorknobs off to China. We don't make air conditioners in America. Well, that's a problem, so we have to buy the air conditioners in China. As a matter of fact, we don't make shower curtains in this country. We don't make a whole bunch of things that went into making an Air Force base. And we couldn't come close to uh, meeting that uh, requirement for 95%. It was just impossible. So this is a big problem. Uh, once you lose your manufacturing to another country, the engineering tends to follow. Because 
in the factories is where they make the changes right away to try to improve the manufacturing process, and the engineers have to be on site right away to be able to handle that. So now we've lost manufacturing, and we've lost a lot of engineering jobs that went with it. Now, the good news. What's the good news? What's happening in America today? Is there any change since China's basically taken over and become the global manufacturer for us? Have you read about any changes going on? What's happening? Is there any good news at all? Good news? No? Good news? Anybody? What's happening in China with wages? They're going up. They're going up 15% a year for the last five years, right? So that's huge. All of a sudden, the difference between Chinese wages and Mexican wages is much smaller. Chinese wages and American wages in the non-unionized plants in the South are much smaller. And when you take into account the shipping costs to get stuff here and the length of time it takes to get it across the ocean to get it here, and some products like fashion products are very um, time-sensitive, uh, conscious. You know, it can go out of style by the time they order it in China, make it, ship it, deliver it, and so on. Uh, there's a lot of advantages in doing these things, which is what we now call nearshoring. Or backshoring, or insourcing. So we're we're coming back to nearshoring, backshoring, bringing manufacturing back to the U.S. because the cost differential is not as great as it used to be. And this is good news, um, and we're discovering that uh, uh, nearshoring, by the way, means we don't necessarily bring it back to the U.S., but we bring it back to a country very close to the U.S where the costs of getting it to us are much cheaper, which means, which countries are we talking about? Mexico. Mexico and Canada, basically. So it's good for Mexico. Mexico's economy is very good. Um, I teach, um, I go to Mexico twice a year to give lectures at the, the uh, it's called Monterey Tech. It's the MIT of Latin America. And uh, uh, contrary to what you might hear in the news, Nobody at these Mexican universities is trying to cross the border to come to the U.S. <coughs> the economy there is very strong. They all are getting great jobs when they graduate from these universities, and they have no interest in coming here. But the class is taught in English, and they're all fluent. Whereas we go abroad, oftentimes, for a year in the, in the U.S. or another country. In high school, they all go abroad for one of their years, abroad usually being England or the U.S., to master English. So these Mexican university students can take their classes in English, and I don't have to speak slowly or anything else. They're very adept, and they're very, very bright. Um, so they are doing pretty well with the nearshoring. Um, and we've also discovered in this country, where we have, um, do you know this expression? A state that's a right to work state. Have you heard that before? Right to work. What does that mean, right to work state? Yes. Is that like they can get fired at any time for any reason? Like more like very broad? Or... Uh, no, that's not okay. really it. That's it's sort of, but that's not the issue. Right to work state. The southern states tend to be right to work states. The northern states like Ohio and New York, Pennsylvania tend to be non right We don't know what that means. No one? Okay. Um, if you are in a right to work state and there's a union at your plant, you don't have to join the union. So you can just be an independent contractor. If you're in uh, Illinois and there's a union in the company where you work, like a manufacturer, you must join the union. You must pay union dues. You're not allowed to be out of the union. So that uh, that changes it. Makes the wages higher because the union controls the wages there. And um, companies that relocate tend to want to go to right-to-work states, like Florida or Louisiana or Alabama. So when, uh, when the Mercedes opened their first plant in the US, it was in Vance, Alabama, it was because it was a right to work state. The other good news is that the cost of wages in Europe, because of all their unions and their requirements, are much higher now than they are in the States. So look what's happening. Uh, Mercedes, BMW, Audi, uh, the, all the Japanese manufacturers are all opening major plants in the United States to manufacture cars for the rest of the world even, not just for our market. So they're finding that our wages, because they've not gone up a lot in the last 15 years, and China and others have gone up, that it's actually better to make the cars and make other products here in the US. So that's good news. And a survey that came out recently of CEOs said that 61% of American CEOs are considering reshoring their products for manufacturing back to the US. And we need that. 
Even if you're never going to work in a manufacturing facility, you need to know that we make our products here because it creates more jobs for everyone else and it helps the economy. So um, outsourcing is changing. We're not the only country that outsources. Japan had only 5% of their uh, companies outsourcing uh, 10 years ago and now they're up to 20%. Uh, the French outsource their call centers to Angola, just like we outsource our call centers to India and to the Philippines. Uh, what else do we outsource that is not manufacturing? Accounting, yes, we're outsourcing accounting to India. It's interesting, isn't it? They have all these accounts in India. They charge a third of what we're charging, and they do accounting. And accounting is accounting. So here we have a career path in the US which isn't necessarily as secure as it once was because even those jobs could be outsourced. The clerical types of accounting ones, anyway. What else could be outsourced? Service types of jobs. Yes? Um, bank security, uh, money laundering efforts, things like that are generally outsourced. To India and, some and a lot of IT, a lot of in information technology is outsourced to India uh, in particular and other countries too. Um, we're doing uh, the revision of my textbook right now, we're just coming out the 12th edition in January, and all the typesetting is being done in India. And for my OM lab, all the coding, it's a lot of computer coding in the software, we outsource it to Russia. Russia's got a lot of scientists, they're much cheaper than Americans. And we do let them do our programming for us. We send them what we want done, and the Russians code up the MyOM lab. They do a sloppy job. We have to go back and redo it a lot, but they're cheap, you know. So uh, we do outsource, but it's it's something that everybody does. Other countries do that as well. But it's, it'd be nice if the manufacturing part of it could be brought back uh, to the U.S. That would really help our economy a great deal. We never think we're going to be back to the point where we have. Uh, 20 or 30% of the jobs in the country in manufacturing, but we can at least try and improve a little bit. Yes, Emily? If you're outsourcing the coding and stuff to Russia, which is what the job, doesn't it cost money to fix that stuff? What, isn't it better to outsource it somewhere else and prevent that from happening? In the yeah, you're absolutely right. The trade off. It's, it's a, the, the publisher, Pearson, says, hey, we're saving a lot of money. Who has to go back and check it? It's the authors who are, aren't paid for that at all. So, from the publisher's perspective, hey, the Russians are cheap. And to fix it, the authors will take care of it. And they're, we don't need it. Can they protect themselves like that? What's that? Can they protect themselves? Like, why do they, why, why do the authors have to go and do it? Well, because ultimately, when something goes wrong with my own lab, or if you find a typo in your book, the professor writes to me. They've all got my email address, vrender.rollins.edu, and they blame it on me. How come you have a mistake in your book? How come your software doesn't work? And we have to address it. So it's, it's still my reputation. So the bottom line is I can't say, oh, the Russians, you know, that, nobody cares about that. Or if there was a Kazi and he's complaining that the MyOM lab rule blew up, and I said, it's the Russians' fault. He's going to say, <laughs> the Russians, you know, I'm sure the Russians. I don't know why you didn't fix it. So, yeah, but there, that's right. Why do people outsource to save money? What are the risks of outsourcing? What are some of the other risks of outsourcing besides perhaps losing the quality, which is, to me, number one. What are some of the other risks? Why wouldn't you outsource everything? Um, you know, Russians could just take your, take your book, copy it, and sell it, not copy it. Right? Yeah, so it's not just the book. It's any problem. When you outsource, that company or that country is gaining the technology and the expertise to make that product. And sometimes they start making it better. So Schwinn bicycles, which we all had when I was a kid, uh, were made in the U.S. They started outsourcing it to Taiwan. And Taiwan started making the bikes for, for Schwinn and sending them back to the U.S. And then Taiwan said, well, wait a second, why are we putting the Schwinn name on? We can make these bikes. <laughs> we'll start manufacturing the bikes, and we'll call it National Bike Company. We'll undercut the price, and it'll be just as good as the Schwinn bike. And they did that. They destroyed Schwinn. So when you outsource, you're risking losing your property. Uh, anyone can copy it. By the way, the Russians steal the books and the Chinese do. We sell hundreds of thousands of copies of my book in China, and they're sold for like 10 cents each because they're all pirated. You know, it's it's when you go to these developing countries, there's no protection for your intellectual property rights. We know that already. Why else would you not outsource? Yes? Um, it could be the ethical issue of poor working conditions or a negative impact on the environment. They just have less standards. Yes, they have less standards, right. So we in this country, um, we have laws about battery recycling. So when you take a battery out of a car, <clears throat> it's got a lot of poisonous chemicals inside. You have to take that out and cleanse it and do all this stuff with it. 
It's a very expensive proposition because we have rules that you have to follow when you decompose a battery in the US. Okay, so what do we do? We send about 90% of our batteries to Mexico and tell them to recycle them for us. What do the Mexicans do? We take a sledgehammer, they knock them apart. The people are, are uh, the ground is contaminated, the workers are poisoned, and they don't have those rules there, and no one gives a damn Mexico. And we then take back the reconditioned battery. We don't ask any questions at all, right? Because it was much cheaper than recycling it or redoing it ourselves in this country. So yeah, there's when you uh, when you outsource, especially to a developing country, there's no control over the um, over the impact on the on the ecology. Anything else you can think of? Yes. This is a good question. Is concerned about unemployment rising because of the outsourcing? Uh, are they concerned about unemployment rising? No. Because they're taking away the jobs from the population of their own country. Yeah, that doesn't seem to be a concern of CEOs in this country. What, you know, in our country, we have uh, the stock market, and they have quarterly uh, reports they have to make. And if you're pro every quarter, you report to the uh, to your public and how your dividends are doing and so on. And people are saying, you didn't make enough profit this quarter. Nobody says, what's your 10-year plan to create more jobs? They say, how much profit did you make this quarter? So the CEOs in this country are under tremendous pressure as opposed to other countries where they take a longer term view. That's, that's a bit of a problem. And the government doesn't do anything about it? Well, you want Congress to get involved in that too, you know, then there's more reporting and there's more, I don't know. It's hard. It's, you know, you gotta, you got to do what's right, uh, and yet um, uh, it's sort of the public that will determine it. You know, if the public goes to a company and says, uh, we don't like the way you're doing things. Um, Nike <coughs> had a terrible reputation about six or eight or 10 years ago because their shoes were all made in uh, really poor countries. 15-year-old uh, kids, 13-year-old kids were making the shoes and uh, you know, it cost a dollar or two to make the shoes and sell them for $200 in the US. And uh, Nike got bad international uh, publicity from this, and they came out with a um, with a statement that had a new mission statement. I wrote it down someplace. Mission statement from China. Ah, manufacturing is lean, green, equitable, and empowered. And that's because they used to use slave laborers to build it. So they they came under such pressure that they came up with this new manu manu manufacturing mission, and they decided to change the way they did things. And they did. Uh, so they really upgraded the quality of their plants and the jobs for the employees. Um, they did things like recycling. If someone turns in a pair of shoes, they don't throw them into a, a pit someplace. They chop them up and they make them into playground material, the stuff that's kind of rubbery that you walk on. And that's their recycling of all the old gym shoes it becomes part of the playground. Um, so Nike has, uh, has tried to do things more sustainably than they did in the past. However, 97% of their shoes are still made in poor countries like you know, Vietnam and some of the other places where uh, we know that the conditions aren't really that good compared to the US. So um, as I talk about uh, uh, different topics from supply chains to outsourcing, what I want to do is go to yet a third topic and talk about sustainability. Because I think this is one of the hottest things uh, around and I think as undergraduates, you need to make sure you take a course at Rollins in sustainability before you graduate. Companies are looking for it, and you want to have a, an edge over other graduates who are coming out, and you want to be able to say, I can come into your place, and I've got a bunch of ideas to make this more sustainable. So let me just tell you one of that story, and that's about Lee Scott. Okay, so he was the CEO of Walmart. And Walmart at the time, this goes back 10 years now, was known as the, the antithesis of a green company. Walmart didn't care what they did as long as you cut the costs. We don't care if you use slave wages, we don't care what you do in the stores, we just want a profit. We just want a profit. That's all they cared about. And the CEO goes on this canoe trip with a guy named Jeb Eliason, an outdoor guy who takes executives on uh, these expeditions. He goes on a one week outdoor adventure, just the two of them. This guy with his canoe and, and Lee Scott. And during their trip, the guy, Jeb Eliason, is telling him, you know, 
all these things in the world, we have to look at ecology, we have to look at this, and at least God's saying, forget it, we have to look at the bottom line. He said, no, no, let's talk about a whole bunch of things that Walmart could do, you know, that would be green, and that you'd be a leader, and people like you more, because people don't like Walmart anymore, they like Nike. And by the end of the trip, Scott said, okay, come up with some sort of plan. So the first thing the guy did was walk in, he went into a Walmart, and he bought a product like uh, one of these uh, electronic uh, cables or something, and the package was like this big, right? You've been in a store, and the package is, is plastic, and you've got to tear it open with the scissors to get inside for this little product that could have fit in your pocket easily. And he said, first of all, why don't you look at your packaging? And why don't you make your packages smaller? It'll give you more shelf space, and it'll save all this plastic that's never recycled that goes into the garbage dumps of the world. And they looked at it and said, well, that's actually an idea that could save us money because we're not going to do it if it doesn't save us money. And they said, well, how about putting solar panels on the roof of your stores? Wow. They put solar panels on the roof of the stores. They cut their electric bill by 9% immediately. Matter of fact, after he bought into it, his first year, they saved $3 billion at Walmart through the sustainability efforts that Lee Scott implemented based on his one-week canoe trip with this guy. And a book was written about it called Force of Nature, how Walmart changed the world. And Walmart went to each of its suppliers, and it has thousands of suppliers, and it said, we have a new code of conduct for all of you. We're all going green together. If you don't do these things, you're not going to be a supplier to us anymore. So they weren't squeezing them on cost like GM's vice president for supply chain did. They're saying, we're all going to do good for the world. We've seen that it's good for business to be more sustainable, and we're going to insist that all of our suppliers follow that same pathway. And they did. So it's amazing. You go to the stores now, and, and they use a new kind of lighting in the stores that cuts the electricity. They put in a whole new fleet of trucks that were refrigerated that didn't use um, the same kind of ways of refrigerating the products that were much more efficient. They could turn the trucks off at night. Some had to run 24 hours a day to refrigerate the trucks. I'm trying to think of some of the other things that Walmart did. A whole bunch. They became the global leader in, uh, in sustainability. A huge change in the last 10 years. And they've proved that you can do it and make a lot of money doing it, which is even better. So this is what I'm saying about sustainability. Every company is looking to save money. And if you come in with a way of uh, making the product uh, without as much waste, there's a Frito-Lay plant about three miles from campus here that makes the chips for the southeast part of the US, and they recycle all their water. They just figure out a way of doing it. They take all the starch, which is a byproduct from the, from the potatoes that's uh, spun off when the chips are made, and they sell it as animal feed. Um, virtually everything that goes in that plant is used and then reused and reused again. There's no waste whatsoever. Uh, Frito-Lay even went a little bit crazy. Um, do you remember this product? Uh, I think it's called Sun Chips, which came up. They don't taste good, right? They're pretty good. But they made a special bag for them. Do you remember the story two years ago? The bags for the sun chips? Yeah, they're very crinkly. They're very, they made a bag, the first bag for chips ever that was biodegradable. The bag would disintegrate, whereas normally the bags would be put into a landfill. Uh, but the bags made a lot of noise. As you touch them, they would they just make a lot of noise. They were noisy for some reason. And customers didn't like them, so they. But they tried everything. You know, they were they were really doing everything they could to make everything sustainable. So we're heading, definitely heading in the right direction. And I think Rollins offers how many courses in manual sustainability scattered all over. I know Brummer has a course. And, and environmental studies has. Environmental studies, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I think one of the most popular electives at uh, in the MBA program is the course where they go to Costa Rica for part of the semester on a sustainability project. So you're going to be doing that when you come into the MBA program. I think that's, you should sign up for that elective. It would be good. And um, um, it's a nice place to visit, too. OK, so uh, let's see. Was there anything else I wanted to mention? I've written some notes down. Uh, sustainability. Uh, da, 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 da. Walmart. Yeah, $3.4 billion a year Walmart is saved in the repackaging alone, it turns out. Just in shrinking the packaging down so you didn't buy a huge Things you get your uh, your power cord adapter in. So I think that uh, that all these things are really good uh, and exciting changes going on in the world. Um, I love the field of operations management because it's a place where you can make a change. Um, if you go in and you uh, read the chapter on quality and you go into a company and you're there in your first year 
and you're thinking, what can I do to make my mark so somebody sees me and recognizes me so I can move up? You look at something that they're not doing quite well. Maybe you can improve the quality of something just by looking at it like a layman would. And, or using some of the tools in your quality chapter, or some of the tools in the process chapter, where you flowchart something and you see how you can improve the process. That's how people are recognized in a company. And that's how they get moved up the chain real quick when management spots someone who goes out of their ordinary job and tries to do something uh, to help the company that they weren't asked to do. So at this point, let me stop and see if you guys have any questions or comments, anything about the course, about the book you want to complain, about my own lab, how bad it is, the Russians, it's all their fault. Uh, anything at all? Do we have some questions, Emmanuel, that you took? Not okay. yet, no. Not one question? <laughs> oh, There's one really comment. Um, everything was clear, but there's, there's no question yet. No questions are coming. This is really disappointing. Yes, there's a question. Okay. Thank you. Well, you said that Walmart, they, uh, they kind of became a leader in sustainability. Yes. But they're still until today, they looked at with kind of like a negative view as yes. they're like not sustainable. You're right. They yeah. still have a negative view. Why is it that Walmart has this negative view in the world? It's not from the sustainability so much, but there's still a very strong negative perception by a lot of people at Walmart. What is the cause of that? I know it's like labor uh, relations. So what do they pay at Walmart? They pay minimum. They have so many employees at Walmart who are uh, who get welfare in addition. They can't even pay rent. I mean, you know, you just can't make a living being a greeter at Walmart or a checkout clerk at Walmart. So the question is. Is Walmart's responsibility to raise the wages of all their employees, knowing that the prices will go up? Because Walmart, their customer, people are watching their pennies, right? So, you know, are you willing to pay double the wages so everyone who works at Walmart can live a better lifestyle, knowing that everything's going to go up by 10% that you buy? Tell me, what's your answer? Well, it's an investment. It's kind of like a trade off. Because there's, there's more people that will maybe willing to buy from you. They look at you as you know, someone that treats their as well. That's a good point. Okay, but I'm asking you personally. Would you rather pay 10% more every time you go into do shop at Walmart? Okay. Would you rather pay 10% more when you buy your next DVD player or TV, knowing that the employees would pay more, or would you rather save 10% given you're on a tight student budget? I think I'd be willing to pay more because I mean most people do shop. I mean a lot of people do shop in public. Other places, just because they kind of like don't like Walmart for that reason. Okay, so that's an interesting thing. Walmart should be aware of the negative reputation it has for that. Yes. I don't think if I could choose between Walmart and 20 percent higher, and then I could go to uh, Target and less, I would probably just choose the cheaper one, even though I knew the wages for the workers. Yeah, because I would probably find the I average probably person find in this country is is on a tight budget. And they're going to go where it's cheaper. I mean, you could say that you big sign outs at Walmart saying we pay more than Target, but we charge more. And boy, that's, I'm heading right for Target then. Yeah, it's a tough one, right? How about that they're paying that little money to their own consumers? Because Walmart has a lot of people, they are the consumers of Walmart. So how do you pay less money to people who are actually supposed to buy from you? Don't you discard them from buying from you in the first place? Well, maybe the Walmart employees get a discount. I don't know. They do get a discount. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, surely everyone who makes more spends more. So it's good for the economy if everyone in this country makes more money. But then, then the prices go up too. So, so it's only stuff outsourcing in the first place. What's that? You need to stop outsourcing. We need to start outsourcing. Stop outsourcing. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Or bring this stuff back and creating more jobs here. Recognizing, though, that for the most part it will still cost more. See, the, the issue with manufacturing is it's changed a lot since we outsourced to China 20, 25 years ago. And what's changed is the companies that are bringing back the manufacturing, and there are many of them that are, are bringing it back in automated factories. So the factory that they closed had 1,000 employees, blue collar jobs. They shipped the, those jobs in effect to China. And now when they bring it back, they're going to run that factory with 15 employees. <coughs> Highly paid employees, but 15. So we say we got manufacturing is growing in this country. That's fine, but the manufacturing jobs are not growing. We're bringing it back with automation, which is very uh, efficient. And I'm glad to get it back, but we're not creating jobs along the way. Yes? But isn't skilled labor kind of increasing in the US? So it kind of makes sense that the 15 jobs would go to skilled labor. To skilled labor. Yes. 
There's, there's a factory that makes precision parts for automobiles in the suburbs in Sanford. I just take my students up to tour. And they have eight $1 million, uh, very sophisticated manufacturing machines, each run by one employee. And they can't find eight employees. They pay 85000 a year for someone to run each machine. Okay, And they can't find American workers who can run the machine. Why? You have to understand uh, what a standard deviation is. You have to be able to calculate a control chart. You have to be able to do all kinds of things that require basically uh, taking a course in STAT in college or more. And American workers who are blue collar don't know how to do those things. And you probably don't want to take that job for 85000 because it's manufacturing. You're standing next to a machine all day long. You want that job for 85? You'll win. <laughs> okay, well, that's fine. They would hire you probably tomorrow. You'd come in. And that would be your job. But we don't have that many skilled workers who want to go in to do the manufacturing stuff uh, and take those jobs. So my friend is complaining, I can't find American workers at $85,000 to run my machines. These aren't simple machines where you're just watching a thing go by every two seconds and clicking a button or something. These are sophisticated machines. Yeah. You see a lot of these like big firms and they have like the power to like, change the buyers to force them to do like stricter stuff. But how about if it's like a smaller like firm? And they can simply just like tell the supplier, like, oh, you better make stricter guidelines for your Right, they have no power at all. Yeah, right. so Small businesses are the heart of our economy in a lot of ways, but they don't have the pool that Walmart can say cut the prices next year. So yeah. do they have the freedom to like use suppliers that are like abusive to the workers and stuff without anyone complaining about it? But most small companies still get their junk from China. That's the reality, or Vietnam, or Bangladesh. And supposedly, we're monitoring the factories in Bangladesh that make most of our clothing now. But remember, they had the fire about three years ago, and 110 women died because the doors were all locked. And uh, everybody said, oh, we got to change. we got to change. we got to change. There's subcommittees, subcommittees. And I noticed there was another fire in Bangladesh recently, and a bunch more people died and in the sweatshops. Because the reality is, very few Americans <laughs> care what goes on. Who makes their clothes in Bangladesh? They just want to know that the scarf you got is a nice quality scarf, and it cost me ten dollars. And if the price was thirty dollars, they may not buy the scarf. So um, that's a problem. But small manufacturers go to China. Small companies get their stuff from China because they can't afford it in the U.S. Yes. How much are you saving by outsourcing your textbook business to different countries? And do you think it's worth it with all of your intellectual property? No, I don't like it at all. First of all, you can't even that. You know, we're constantly emailing every day to someone in India, uh, and uh, there's miscommunications all the time. And stuff's coming back. Somehow, even though it's wireless going from there, uh, I'll send in a paragraph that's perfect, and it comes back with um, a couple exclamation marks replacing a word. I think, how did that happen? Because electronic transmission that goes overseas, somehow or another gets screwed up. So for me, I don't like it at all. But you know, the publisher is probably saving millions every year by having India do all the typesetting for all the books. It's the biggest publisher in the world. So they made a decision to go to India, which is probably not good for America at all. But otherwise, the books go up even more. You know how expensive they are already. Yeah. So, Ryan, in the back of the room. Um, why do you think so many companies wait to see proof that sustainable practices are efficient and cost effective? Even though so many custom, uh, even though so many consumers dislike and recognize unethical business practices, it seems like so many companies are obsessed with improving the bottom line through inefficient means. Do you think that the bottom line could ever change to encourage businesses to focus more on sustainability and preservation? Uh, to encourage businesses to do what? To focus more on susten sustainability and preservation. Wow, what a great question. Answer it for me, will you? Help me out. <laughs> I defer to you, knowing you're No, 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 I defer to you. I can't answer that. I don't know the answer. That's, that's a really good question. Anybody got any ideas on the answer to that? We have talked a little bit about ethics in this class. Yeah. And, and, and I think there's a combination between you know, um, ethics and sustainability. We're thinking, yes. how do people make ethical decisions? What drives them to do it? And most, most of the time, um, the decisions are made based on the bottom line. So, um, for example, if it's a public company and they have to report you know, quarterly profits, and then they start in that grind. And unless there is external pressure from 
consumer societies and from other people, sometimes on social media and stuff, to bring attention to the unethical practices, right. they're not willing to change. So I, I think there's a whole thing about, like, like when you talk about quality, that quality, improving quality seems to be a cost, but eventually it's, it's uh, an asset to, to the company. Definitely. You know, because your, your products are, are higher quality and you can charge better and you can reduce the waste and all of that. I think that's the kind of thinking that companies need to do in understanding this whole thing about ethics and sustainability. If they don't understand how it benefits them, then they would um, try to do the, the easiest or cheapest way out and, and leave out it. But, it. but it is more difficult. Quality is easy. I can understand when I'm buying something, oh, this is a very high quality product, I'll pay the extra 20 cents for it. But sustainability, I don't know what the company's doing. You know, I can't tell by looking at this bag of potato chips versus that bag of potato chips which one is more sustainable. I can't, I, I can't do research on a thousand <laughs> different products that buy at Publix or at Walmart or Costco. So it's, it's a lot harder, I think. Um, and it will change only from people. That is, Nike changed because people got, they got bad press from some athletes and some other people on TV. And Walmart changed, not for that reason, but because they figured out they could save money and, and do well. So there's, but nothing is simple. I mean, sometimes you think you're doing good, like my wife insists we do all organic. And I just read the other day that the organic farmer uses five times as much land and resources to produce that same organic product that I eat than the non-organic farmer was. And it wastes a lot of water, and it wastes a whole bunch of things that are scarce resources, so that I can eat a tomato that's organic and pay more for it. But in terms of what's best for our country, organic is not what's best for our country. It's best for eating, maybe, but it's not best for the ecology of the country. It's interesting how the trade-off is there. You think you're doing good by eating all organic, but you're destroying our farmland in this country. You're making it less productive. Can't win, you know? Try and do the right thing. What else? Yes? Uh, can you recommend us two or three books uh, in your specialty? Uh, a few books to read? Yeah, that will be like yes. a would be interesting to read. Absolutely. Uh, a famous quality guy who actually lived a few blocks from campus, uh, and his name is um, um, Phil Crosby. He died some years ago and left us his whole library here at Crummer as a donation. Uh, he wrote 10 books on quality. One of his, his classics are Quality is Free. You can get it as an e-book, you can get it online. And a whole bunch of others, and they're all excellent. And um, if you read any one of them, uh, then you're going to learn a lot about what you can do to, uh, to make improvements very easily in a, in a company. So I recommend any one of his, any one of his books. Um, the other things that I find are useful are not so much books, but every day I read the Wall Street Journal cover to cover, and I read Forbes and Fortune. And you learn a lot. I mean, I don't think you need to go to school if you read those two things every day. You can just skip rounds. And uh, if you read those three every day from cover to cover, you're going to learn a lot more than you ever will in four years in, in Rollins. Um, because everything is there. It's all there. And it's all there with what's going on in the world today. So it's current. It's interesting, it's well written, and um, and it's just and I think it's pretty interesting. You read through these different magazines, and you can pick one up. Business Week I read also, and you'll always find one article that's just fascinating. You know that really excites you. And that's all you have to do from each issue is find one thing that you learned each day from that. So that's a good investment of time is to uh, get a subscription to one of them. Okay. Anything else? Well, then I will say goodbye to all of you. Thank you very much for your attention today. It's nice to see you.